If you ever have to flee an airport, don't run out of departures because that's where we're expecting uh, you to go. Go down to arrivals because a lot of other people are uh, coming in there. It's always a floor under, under departures. We're talking about the uh, early 70s and uh, back at this time. And like all teenagers, I absorbed the counterculture as much as I could and thought that revolution was what was expected uh, to fight back against any authority. I went to a, a, a private school, but it was terrible. It was all boys and boring. Well, I was asked to find another school over an incident with the uh, chemistry teacher. He accused me of wanting to uh, make up a batch of LSD, of all things. But really, I, I didn't quite fit into that. This was a time when uh, drug use was not particularly uh, underground. My, uh, my mother's friends uh, were pot smokers. And I wasn't even a, a regular smoker. But on the, the, the Melbourne and the Australian drug scene, uh, hard drugs were not massively distinguished between anything else. Cocaine and heroin were just some things that were also available. A girl I knew worked at a cinema. A boyfriend was a safe cracker. When I got to know these guys, they retired from safe cracking. It was, they were too well known. And they used to buy up a whole lot of grass and weed when they could, and some hash, but they didn't have any way of getting anything bigger. And they were saying that it was really impossible for them to bring it in. And being a little smart ass that I was, I thought, really? And so that was the attraction. I'd left my day job. Uh, and had to get funded by one of the guys from the Safe Crackers group. Now, he gave me a few thousand dollars and, and really didn't hold out much hope that anything would come of it. How did it work? In my case, badly. I made as every conceivable mistake possible. When I first landed in India in search of hashish, just to get things going, I got uh, swindled outside American Express by some con men there you know, offering discount rates. Then couldn't find a good connection. I even turned to the shoeshine boys on the street who managed to score me some pretty rough edge but smokable sort of hash. Um, but persistence and time will lead you to the connections you need to make. I had so much to learn. Uh, I was lucky, I survived a lot of errors. I arrived back in Sydney with um, almost six kilos of hash. At that time there was, um, they didn't use the system that they developed. It was just one guy behind a, a desk and he unzipped my case, asked me where I'd been of course, and he looked inside. Inside there was a 1950s Grundig radio, a big old thing that had once had tubes and dials and levers inside, but now had nothing. There was no clever packing in this one. It was the hash bricks were just wrapped up, stuffed inside, stuffed so firmly the casing was buckled at the top. This customs officer knew perfectly well I mean, he even spun the dial of the radio and it kept on spinning. No levers moved. He knew what it meant. He looked around to see if anybody was watching because he wanted to let me go. And he looked at me rather firmly and said, are you going back there? No, no, no. We'll see that you don't. And you can take your uh, radio, we'll call it, and get going. What this family man didn't want was to propel me into the jail system 
the world of prisons. I guess he was experienced enough to know what that would mean. But you can imagine for somebody just turned 19, as I bounced out of the airport terminal, thinking myself the cleverest smuggler around. In fact, just some half-wit that had been given a break. I began a series of operations with um, a series of drug runs where I was taking it myself. My wife at the time, an Italian girl, her father had restaurants. She was on at me not to be doing it myself, so I found helpers, couriers. I found one in what turned out to be the best courier I'd ever had. This guy ran a couple of plant shops. Um, she, she over decorated things with Venus fly traps and crawling palms and things. He ruined them. He was just a spender of money. He was perfect for me. And he could imagine himself in different worlds. I had Peter once run, we went out of Bangkok, he had two kilos. The swap was done and he arrived at Belgium. The system then was to change passports in Europe so that your endpoint, in this case it was a transfer in the UK, you would arrive with documentation that said you'd only been in Europe. And I watched Peter arrive. Now, without any suggestion from me, he had turned himself into what was clearly a professional tennis player. He arrived in white shorts and t-shirt, uh, even had the racket in his hand, and it was an expensive one. He was giving the MX card I'd given him for expenses, a thorough bashing on that one. And I asked him what he was thinking as he came through, untouched, of course. He said, I was thinking of the matches I've won and, and the, the games I've played. And this was the kind of person who made perfect couriers. How did you move into the position where you could actually be arrested and imprisoned in Australia? What was the journey there? The end came about in Australia due to arrogance. I was still, after all, only in my early 20s. What did I have? Hmm? I had an office, a couple of houses, spent money carelessly, but not publicly, but I'd been reported. Now, I knew the police were following me because in those days before encrypted radio signals, we could listen in on them. When the day came that um, I arrived back home and said to my wife, clearly there's some poor guy being watched in the area. I, I, grab my handheld and go out and take a look. Maybe I can tip him off. I threw the handheld in the car, switched the remote control for the garage door, and on the radio said, yeah, the garage door's coming up. I said, what a break, the guy's going out just now. Uh, I'll really be able to warn him. Uh, the LTD's backing out, we can see the Ford. And he's got a Ford <laughs> I'm starting to realize that this is me being watched. And there were no slouch operatives. And I was given 15 years, of which I had to do 10. At the end of a long sentence, the usual course is that people are in uh, low security prisons and they go home to a welcoming family. Though I had the welcoming family, it wasn't the usual path. I was at a very low security prison, but I was being followed from my day leaves home. Police were watching me. They had even visited me to say that they kind of missed the old days when they used to chase me around. And I found that when I got home, they were there. When I rented a flat, they were there. They'd leave little notes and abusive messages on uh, my answer phone. I couldn't move without them. So I backed away and I left the country because I knew it would never end with them. The plan was to go to Europe, to come back to London. I'd had a few things here, I had a safety deposit box here, so a little money, but most of it was in Thailand because I'd taken it back there with my uh, friend Lee, my contact there. It was a very odd thing to arrive in Thailand. 
I'd taken such precautions to get there. I had two false passports that I'd gone through virtually from the grave up, from the, the death certificates and birth certificates. Nobody could know that I was leaving because that would be the end too. After three days of unknown freedom in Thailand, I went to the airport to continue my journey. I went to the check-in desk and handed over my passport. And I was already getting an odd feeling, but who doesn't at an airport check-in? And then she cross-checked against a list. And she said, oh, just a minute, I have to check something. She walked away with that passport. There are moments <clears throat> when, in the blinking of an eye, you know that everything you have done has failed. I looked up, I could see at a railing, a couple of uh, uniform guys watching me. I could see some plain clothes watching me and actually froze for a minute because there was no, of course there was a theoretical backup plan, there, there has to be, the second passport. But it was just to walk away from everything again. I'd lost one life, a second life, the one that I just left in Australia. But I didn't really have time to think, uh, think about that. I did back off. I picked up my travel bag, the important one with the, <clears throat> the money in the, the second passport, and went down to arrivals. If you ever have to flee an airport, don't run out of departures because that's where we're expecting uh, you to go. Go down to arrivals because a lot of other people are coming in there. It's always a floor under, under departures. I found a taxi in the middle of a scrum of probably hundreds and through a lot of argument with his fellow drivers, bribed my way back onto the highway going into town. Driving back there, even with the window open, my head was burning with rage that I can't tell you how careful I'd been. I thought I'd been, so that nobody could detect where I was. Arriving back into the city, I took two tuk-tuks and, and a motorcycle as well. I'd go to a travel agency we knew. Ah, old players, retired, had a little travel agency in Bangkok. I could use their phone and maybe work out where to go next. As I arrived there in an arcade, having done all these steps to lose people, I see a pile of cigarette butts opposite. But you take these things in the corner of your eye. As I walked into the travel agency and headed for the phone, I could feel the the swing of the door behind me and the air coming in. And I connected it with the cigarette butt. Somebody had been standing there waiting. Somebody knew that's where I'd go to. I turned and there were three plainclothes Thai police. They said various things, but it didn't matter. One had a gun, but there's nothing I could do about that. Take it out and shoot myself. It's the only shot I'd get off. As I was taken into Chinatown Police Station, I saw the American DEA agent that I knew from the Australian case, Bill Schenkman, and a couple of Australian faces that uh, no doubt liaison staff. After arrest, you spend seven days in the local police cells. Then you get transferred to a court, and that not going well, and it never does, you go to the main prison. I learned many and terrible things about the Thai courts that virtually everybody is found guilty. You can fight your case and it may you take longer, up to five years. Even pleading to a case takes a year and a half, but I couldn't do that. I was charged with the false passport, um, the money, which was now written up as a uh, $4,000 seemed to have disappeared. And they'd done a little sweep of the airport and found enough drugs to see me face the death penalty. It only takes over 25 grams for an airport case, and that will put you on death row. I would be found guilty as 
and within two weeks sentenced to death. From the moment I stepped into that prison in Bangkok, escape was on my mind. I had my nose glued to the cracks in the cell bar on the sleeping guard, probably 60 feet down the way. But the first stroke of that tungsten steel on these old bars seemed to carry throughout the whole building. In an escape, there's one thing for sure, everybody is alone. Up until this point, everything's okay, you know? We go to the baggage thing, our bags ain't coming, yeah? Everybody else has got the bags, right? And then the police just come around with guns and say to me, right, you, boom, hands up in the air, 